Thank you, Jim. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, first day back for me as well. Uh, I started in Perth this morning at half past seven. I uh, got the lunchtime flight down. Thankfully, British Airways was on time. In fact, we were 10 minutes early, so that was good. Um, I thought I'd take this opportunity to reflect. Uh, I've been a chartered accountant for over 25 years, uh, and I've been finance director of SSE uh, for over 12 years. Um, over that time, I've seen three economic recessions. Um, but it was the economic crash of 2008 that undermined trust where the public no longer trust both the competence and motives of those who hold the levers of power and wealth. And during that time, I've watched how expectations have changed. Expectations on people in public life, on politicians, on journalists, uh, and on businesses and their leaders, and on finance directors. This is especially true for the energy industry. Just over a year ago, the industry was subject of four consecutive Prime Minister's questions time uh, and an opposition party promised to freeze prices. In situations like these, the business community often refer, revert to defensiveness. But the truth is, my industry needs to work a whole lot harder to earn the right to be profitable. So tonight, and within that context, I'd like to reflect on the CFO's dilemma. And this notion of a dilemma resides on an idea that there is a disputable choice of finance leaders, that there is always a trade-off between making money in the short term as opposed to being a force for good in the long term. Of course, that assumes that it's not possible to earn profit and contribute to society. My argument this evening is that they should be one and the same thing. Simply put, we no longer have the public consent to do one unless we do the other. I also want to make the argument that the role of the FD or CFO is changing, that our finance world needs to understand not only financial and manufactured capital, but we need to understand, respect and account for social, human and natural capital as well. And I will try and get the balance right this evening between reflecting on trends that are economy-wide, on trends that affect my particular sector, and the very specific company response that I can speak on behalf of. But I'll start with the SSE story. SSE as a business has an essential purpose at its core. We are here to provide energy in a reliable and sustain sustainable way. The nature of our product, providing people with something they need, not simply something they want, places an additional dimension of expectation on us. As a privatised industry, we must always pay due regard to our special status. We are a creature of statute, and with that, I'd argue there are greater obligations and higher standards we should abide by. When a company begins its journey to understand the complexities and sophistication it requires to be tr truly sustainable, we all tend to think about our impacts. The impacts that our operations have on society, the environment and the economy. At SSE, as with a number of other companies, we started to calculate and publish our economic impacts on a regular basis. We've always known that as a large energy company in the UK, investing around £1.5 billion a year in UK infrastructure, that we had, we'd have a positive impact on UK jobs and wealth. The question was, how much? So, the starting point was to find out exactly that. And of course, the numbers were big. 27 billion of GDP supported in the last three years, and over 100,000 jobs a year. That is around 0.7% of UK GDP, equivalent to constructing and, stage, and, sta and staging the London Olympics every year. Measuring and disclosing your impacts is like an onion. We peeled off the first layer and discovered many more layers underneath. Knowing that we have a big impact on the economy is clearly interesting, but I'm more interested in creating new knowledge that is also instructive. We wanted to know 
how that macroeconomic impact was supporting local communities and economies. So we started to undertake in-house impact studies, publishing them and importantly, learning from them so we could discover how to enhance the impacts for local people. And I've been inspired by the County for Sustainability CFO Leadership Network, alongside dozens of other like-minded FDs and CFOs under the leadership of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Recently, we published guidance to support CAPEX decision-making, providing a framework for valuing social and environmental impacts. Within SSE, we've undertaken a massive exercise to develop methods with PwC to quantify the impact of a major transmission line, creating a valuation for things like visual amenity, cultural heritage, as well as the more conventional things like jobs and GDP. These numbers are useful, but Einstein once said, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. That means we need to treat the quantification of social and environmental capital with respect. A good example is the value of natural capital. SSC heritage comes from the Hydroelectricity Board in the north of Scotland. We are custodians of built heritage that is second to none which is located in a world-class natural environment. The natural capital embodied within these assets is priceless. It is precisely because it is so special and irreplaceable that any impacts on it should be valued. And as an accountant, I want some of that value to be quantitative, not just qualitative. In the next few months, we are taking important steps, again tackling some tricky concepts. Amongst all companies claim that their people are their greatest assets. Shortly, SSE will publish a report that will quantify the value of SSE's human capital. That report will demonstrate the enormous value of that asset to the company and to society. Unlike traditional assets, we borrow from society the people we employ. But that doesn't mean we don't have an obligation to invest in them like we do with any other asset. This new research will help us understand how to enhance that value, partly for company gain, but also for the individual's benefit and society's gain too. Human capital is simply the next step on our journey to understand and influence positively our overall impact on the world in which we operate. Despite all of this action to broaden quantitative measures, Decision-making still requires subjective judgment. And subjective judgments are best guided by a clear set of values, a healthy culture, and a moral compass too. We have thought, thought additional help to guide some of those decisions, frameworks that define a more responsible course of action. For SSE, there have been two organizations that have helped guide us in two specific areas. The Living Wage Foundation, and the fair tax mark. SSE became a living wage employer in September 2013. We were the biggest company at the time to achieve accreditation. And we're the only energy company to guarantee all its employees a living wage. The living wage is calculated at a rate that people need to earn to live a decent life. Earning below the living wage in all likelihood means you will be living in poverty. More than 50% of people in poverty in the UK have a job. And there are over 5 million people in the UK who earn less than the living wage. That can't be right in this day and age. Of course, things won't change overnight. But for those of us who can, there are things we can do about it. SSE's contribution is, set, is to set the living wage standard and guarantee that no one employed by us will earn less than the living wage rate. But we can make a bigger difference too. Our supply chain is really big, around £2.5 billion pounds a year. And through clauses in new service and works contracts, any individual that works regularly on an SSE site will be guaranteed a living wage too. But this point about welcoming external guidance to help define the higher standards of responsibility is relevant elsewhere too. In October this year, we took 
what some have described as a bold decision to become the first FTSE 100 company to be fair tax accredited. Before I talk about what we did and what it means, I think it is important to understand why an energy company chooses to pursue voluntary standards on corporation tax. Fundamentally, it comes down to the lack of trust between consumers and the big businesses that serve them. This is the greatest challenge my industry faces. And co corporation tax has become totemic to consumers. The Institute of Business Ethics found that tax avoidance is the main business concern of consumers. It now beats executive remuneration as the issue that they are most concerned about. But think about it. Executive remuneration has been there for many years. Tax avoidance has been there for many years. This is now one of the big, big issues. And in another poll by Christian Aid, we know that consumers are voting with their feet too. One third of Britons say they are boycotting the products or services of a company because it does not pay its fair share of tax in the UK. Two out of three Britons believe tax avoidance is morally wrong. At 80% of Britons are angry at companies who use artificial financial constructs to avoid paying tax. Now we all know that there is a difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. One is within the law, the other is not. And the definition of tax avoidance is subjective. One person's tax avoidance is another person's smart tax planning. The point I'm making is that society's ex expectations of what is acceptable conduct is changing. Actions that are perfectly legal can be entirely un unacceptable to customers and consumers. And as business leaders, we can't shrug our shoulders and ignore it. We have to listen hard and respond. The Chancellor's autumn statement looks to me like the politicians are listening. The introduction of tax on profits diverted out of the UK and faster progress on country by country reporting, I believe, are a direct response to the sort of public opinion expressed in the research I mentioned. So for SSE, the fair tax mark has provided us with a service that we needed. We welcomed the standards they set. It was a journey. They challenged us, cajoled us, and encouraged us. But in the end, we achieved accreditation because we took steps towards increased transparency. We published a tax policy explicitly ruling out the use of artificial tax avoidance schemes and tax havens. We undertook country by country reporting, albeit with only two countries. And we provided far more explanation to the notes to our accounts. And one, while some in the accountancy world have raised an eyebrow at our fair tax mark, the feedback we receive from employees and customers has been excellent. It is exactly the type of action they wanted their energy company to take. To conclude my argument, I shall return to the title of this session, the notion that there is something of a CFO dilemma. The CFO's dilemma, in my mind, is not so much a binary choice between the soft things that support society as opposed to the hard things like shareholder return. The dilemma is not the choice between those things. The dilemma is the choice of the actions you take to ensure you can achieve both. As accountants, we were trained to be objective, to let the numbers do the talking, to conduct ourselves to the highest levels of professional conduct, and we take pride in that professionalism. But I would argue that the CFO is at the centre of a change that's happening within business, where corporate responsibility is no longer the philanthropic sideline that is a million miles away from the core business. It is now an essential part of the CFO's toolkit. Sustainability and corporate responsibility is now a cornerstone of successful businesses, where finance teams are providing increasing leadership within their organisations to ensure decision-making fully encompasses economic, social and environmental impacts. And in my view, companies that fail to ensure this will risk their overall business model and ultimately the right to make an appropriate profit. Thank you. <laughs>